How are you doing? <laughs> so you do understand English. Yes. Since I am an American, I only really speak one language, and that one poorly. But you will make up for all the languages that I do not know. Um, let's wake everybody up with the sound check. There we go. Yeah. All of your questions will be answered if you go to markturner.org. So what is my name? Right. That's all you have to remember. Markturner.org. There are papers. There are video recordings. There are question and answer sessions. There's my email address. There are my research teams and so on. I would really like to thank uh, the organizers, the Federal University of uh, Rio de Norte, the Brain Institute at the university, and all of you who have put in so much work to make this, uh, this happen. Today, we're going to talk about creativity and innovation. And tomorrow, we'll talk about how to communicate about creativity and innovation, although I can do this in any order. If anybody has any questions, we'll just do it a slightly different way. Now, I want to point out that we need to have major initiatives to publish more and share ideas in creativity and innovation. And I uh, have an offer for you. The, uh, the offer is that you publish all of your work at SSRN.com. SSRN.com is the Social Science Research Network. It's free. It's by professors for professors. Authors keep copyright to all of their articles, to all of their memos. You can put it up. You can take it down. Um, it is not a commercial venture. I work for them free as the director of the Cognitive Science Network. So here's the Cognitive Science Network. Uh, many of the universities, most many of the world's most influential universities sponsor the Social Science Research Network. Uh, it, these are old figures. Um, we've been having something like uh, a million downloads a month of papers. There are now over 60 million downloads, running at about, one, about 12 mil million a year. Uh, the Cognitive Science Network, which I run, um, is for work on creativity, innovation, brain, mind, philosophy. And uh, it's not for profit. It never takes copyright. Authors can upload papers, search and download papers uploaded loaded by authors free. Uh, you can post a working paper there. And when you do, it doesn't count as a publication. So if you want to publish it in a journal, you can then publish it in a journal. Uh, you can take it down. You can leave the link. You can do pretty much anything you want. Um, now, here's an interesting point. Papers can be posted in any language including Brazilian Portuguese, with all of those hundreds of thousands of academics that want to look at them. All you have to do is translate the title into English, a little abstract in English, right? But even the title and the abstract can be Brazilian uh, Portuguese. Um, so if you go to my web page, for instance, it will very frequently say download, 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 download. And if you click on that, it goes to the Social Science Research Network, and they host the paper. Everybody gets an author page, so here's my author page on SSRN, and you, you can make one. And then everybody can find all of your papers, right? Um, see, here's a listing of my papers. This is what happens when you click on a link. You get to see, ah, here's the abstract for the paper, and so on. We have very sophisticated search facilities 
so that you can search throughout the social sciences. And we have an arrangement with Google so that things that are in the Cognitive Science Network, the Social Science Research Network, get a very high posting. Um, we send out alerts on new papers. Um, as you can see, if you type in Cognitive Science Network, we're the first thing that comes up in Google. So a lot of what a lot of people do is have a web, their own web page. And then on their web page, they post links so that you can download. The motto of this is tomorrow's research today. And all of you, with your little personal devices right now, could establish accounts. It takes about one minute. You can put up anything you want. You can let people know about it. You can share it. You don't have to host it on your servers. I uh, started doing this a while ago because as I go around the world, one of the problems we find is that people are not aware that other scholars in other countries are working on very similar issues. And it's difficult to get the books, and it's difficult to get the articles. But that excuse is finished. That's all over. It's free. It's available. It's fast. It's run by, it's run by professors. And I hope, uh, I hope if you want to find a way to get your research known in the world, that you have a look at this, this is a, this is a good way to do it. So let's talk about creativity. One of the largest scientific problems with creativity is why there should be any, right? We all know about biological creativity. Natural selection and other evolutionary mechanisms can make interesting new species that can do things. They can spin spider webs, that can fly. I can't spin a spider web, and I can't fly. I can't echolocate like a bat and find the insect and eat it. I can't even photosynthesize like a plant, right? So we know these biological mechanisms for creativity. But something strange happened. Maybe 100,000 years ago, maybe 50,000 years ago, somewhere, human beings took an extra step in mental ability. Human beings began to put together things that don't really go together. They began to blend very opposed things. So here's a stone, but the stone is a woman. Now, I assure you, I know a woman and a stone are not the same thing. <laughs> very, very different. That's very important, in case you didn't know. It's very important, right? Also, women are not this high, and they move. But here's a stone that is static, lifeless, and about this big. And you can blend that with the concept of a woman and have something that looks absolutely normal to you, but that no other species makes. You begin to have in the archaeological record evidence for an amazing leap, maybe not all at once, maybe gradual. I don't have a time machine, but if I had a time machine, I would go back 50,000 years and look around to try to see how this happened. You begin to get dressed, not just to stay warm, which is already an interesting thing, but to indicate social status. You begin to get burial, like this. You begin to get representations in the caves. Now, to give you an idea of how recent this is, human beings separated, or the line that produced us and the line that produced chimpanzees, Pan trogloditis and pan paniscus, those are bonobos, uh, separates about five and a half, six million years ago, something like that. Um, two million years ago, we get the genus Homo. About 150,000 years ago, 
we get anatomically modern human beings. In other words, people who have your organs and your skeletons, right? And about 50,000 years ago, we've been, we begin to get evidence of cognitively modern human beings, all of these archaeological records. Now, 50,000 years ago in evolutionary time is nothing. It's a blink of an eyelash. It's nothing. Evolutionary change, evolutionary creativity takes a very long time, millions of years, to put together these species. But human beings develop a mental ability to put things together, and suddenly we have this creative explosion. Culture becomes possible. And cultural evolution, cultural creativity moves much, much faster than evolutionary creativity. Think of it, almost all the things you care about, law, science, mathematics, technology, painting, art, religion, fashion, all of that's been invented in you know, a few thousand years, just yesterday, just nothing, in a fast and quick cultural move. Other species are very impressive. We can talk about the instincts they have. We can, we can talk about how brilliant dogs are. Audiences love it when I talk about how brilliant dogs are. Who owns a dog? Yeah, you know how smart dogs are, right? But human beings move much more quickly and across vast ranges of time, space, causation, and agency. And biologically, this is very strange, because we are just another great ape. If an anthropologist from Mars came here and looked at us, they would think that we're, you know, another great ape. We have the common mammalian brain, we have the common primate brain. We are just another great ape. But we're a great ape with an amazing ability for cognitive creativity. So an example of this kind of creativity is the lion man. The lion man was found. Um, in the 1990s, but it was in shards, right? Uh, these shards were found in a drawer in the 1990s. It was really found in like 1932 in Germany, these little shards. And when they reassembled it, they got this. Now, the Lion Man is about, you know, this big, right? It's carved out of an antler, and it was in, found in a cave in Germany, okay? And so this is about 32,000 years old, okay? Just yesterday, just yesterday. And it really has sparked an awful lot of interest among paleoanthropologists and archeologists. So if you look at, uh, let's see, this is from science. If you look at science, there was a set of articles about the lion man in which people said, what happened? How did you suddenly manage to get these kinds of creations, this amazing representational creativity? And so some uh, psychologists said, well, maybe there was an expansion in working memory. Because now you could hold a lion and a man in mind at the same time. OK? So uh, it. Models were proposed to suggest that this shift in working memory might have been the key to the evolution of human cognition and our creativity. But you know, I think although the working memory hypothesis is interesting, and it could be the case that working memory expanded. It's very hard to believe that a human being couldn't already hold in mind the idea of a lion and a man, because when a lion eats a man, or a lion kills a man, you've already got them both in mind in a little story. The most interesting thing to me about artifacts like the lion man is it puts together a lion and a man. So you have a lion and you have a man. And remember, a woman is not a stone. Well, a lion is not a man either, and you shouldn't get confused. It's a very bad idea, evolutionarily, to fail to distinguish a lion and a man. You shouldn't put them together in some ways, right? 
but we do. In fact, conflict between things that don't go together, conflict in causation, conflict in action, conflict in participant structure, conflict in scale, these are the things that mainly stop any other species from being flexible. But human beings seem to specialize in putting together things that don't go together. I would point out that we're here not just putting together a lion and a man. We're also putting together the lion and the man with the little antler and carving. Somebody carved this antler. Now, human beings don't come into existence by carving, right? Human beings are not made up out of antler, right? You shouldn't put these things together. But in our world, not only do we put together a lion and a man and have a totemic representative that can inspire our thinking about our identity. We're lion men, we're lion people, we're fox people, we're bird people, we're whale people. We also can put it together with materials and now make representations. So the lion man is not the antler. The lion man is an idea you have of a ferocious, upright, powerful entity who moves. This is a, an external representation. And they're all over the place. So now uh, Pygmalion sculpts his dream girl, and then she becomes real. All of these things suddenly become available. So there's a lot of work on that. And what I want to say about the time scale is this. Um, This ability to put things together and do new things didn't come completely out of the blue. There had been some of those abilities before for a long time, since maybe Australopithecus, right? But it was extremely slow. And I'm going to give you an unforgettable example of how slow it was. There is a tool set that was used in the hominid line. A tool set basically means you take a rock and you break it, and then you get a, you break it in a certain way, and then you get a sharp edge and something you can pound with, right? That's a tool set. I'm not talking about ratchet wrenches and screwdrivers here. I'm talking about a little tool set that comes out of a rock, all right? Well, the old Darwin tool set was invented in the hominid line, right? And it was used across the homo genus, and it was everywhere the same. Everywhere the same, this little tool set. Now, if you give that tool set to a child, and uh, I saw a child last night playing. The child was very inventive, did all kinds of things, pretended to be a lion man, right? Then switched into kung fu. Second after second, but if you give this tool set to a child, the child will do something new with it in five minutes. Come up with a new way to use it, invent something. This tool set took a long time to invent, and once it was invented, it lasted for a period without change. No innovation, no creativity. Can anybody guess how long it lasted like that? Let's have one guess. Who's courageous? One guess. 10,000. That would be a long time. 10,000 years with no change. No change. Not one change. The answer is 800,000 years. I want everybody to say 800,000 years. You. 800,000 Now think about that. Now, baby, child, five minutes. Before. Yeah, okay, so that's the kind of difference that we're talking about. Somehow, human beings took an extra step up this ability to integrate <laughs> ideas, and suddenly everything exploded. So the theory I'm talking about today is that there was a development, an evolutionary development since early mammals, of the ability to put things together, and it moved very slowly.
But when humans got to the advanced ability to blend, um, it just exploded. And out of that comes a great range of human capacities that all feed each other. So I'm going to give you an idea of coming up with a new, uh, with a new notion. Right? So suppose I mentioned to you that I have a stockbroker brother-in-law. And he lives in San Francisco. That's in California, that one. And he has to get up at like 5 o'clock in the morning because the stock market opens in the East Coast at 9.30, which means at 6.30 Pacific time, he has to be ready to work. Well, I never get up in the morning. The only time I see 6.30 in the morning is when I've stayed up all night, right? So I can say, if I were my brother-in-law, I would be miserable, right? Now notice, I am not my brother-in-law. It's a very important not to confuse those two things. And I'm not miserable, and he's not miserable. But when I say, if I were my brother-in-law, now there's somebody who's me but my brother-in-law but not really my brother-in-law. Only some things come from me, not my job, because now I would, then I couldn't be a stockbroker. And only some things come with, from his side of the idea. Obviously, his family relations don't project down to this me being my brother-in-law, because if they did, then I would be my own brother-in-law, and that's taboo. That's not allowed, <laughs> right? And there's a new feature this person in the blend is now miserable. Notice, I'm not miserable, he's not miserable. You blend them into a new person, and now that person is miserable. Where is this person? This person is not here to be seen. This person is a new idea. The misery is a new idea. And you all get it just like that, very, very quickly. So what I'm talking about is the amazing, the amazing ability human beings have to hold two ideas in mind at the same time. This is already a cognitive scientific problem. Why is it that you should be able to think of something that doesn't help you right here, right? So we understand if the dog goes into the woods and needs to get out, maybe the dog will remember getting into the woods because that helps getting out. But you can think about the time that you flew to Europe. You can think about the dinner you had last night. You're not having dinner. You're sitting here listening to me. I'm looking at you. Why should you come up with these memories of another time? That Why don't you get confused, right? So this is a huge problem in cognitive science, studied by many people. But what I'm talking about is the fact that you can link two things so there's an I, and there's my brother-in-law, and we're both human beings, so we have a framed link. There's an analogical link. And then we can project from these two ideas to a new idea, me as my brother-in-law, that has new properties, is miserable, not in the original ideas, right? So you get, it's not just a cut and paste. You get new properties in the blend that are not projected down from the inputs. And as I say, it's very, we specialize in being able to put together things that don't go together, like me and my brother-in-law. We're not confused. We're not crazy. But we can come up with a new idea doing it this way. Now, I showed you the lion man. And so it may seem as if the kind of creativity I'm talking about is very unusual. You know, carving strange figures poetic license and so on. But what I want to indicate is this ability to put things together that don't go together and to get a new idea is working in your brains all the time, constantly. That's what the human brain specializes in, to understand my gestures, to understand my language, to understand these little things that I'm showing here on the screen. You're already doing massive blending. Notice I say things like, well, you take one idea. Does that look like an idea to you? 
that yellow circle? No, that's not an idea. But I say you take one idea, no problem, and you take the other idea, those aren't ideas, I say, and you have a connection. Does that look like a connection? No, it's, a, it's some black dots. But you are able to make a representation plan and hold it, and move it, and play with it. You're doing this all the time. So I'm going to give you an example of something that we wouldn't notice as a blend, but is really a very powerful blend, very powerful new idea. We can't live without it. It's everywhere. And it's part of a pattern that human beings use all the time. It's called the cyclic day. OK? Now, you know about a day. Dawn comes around again, right? Everybody knows about the day. The day will come around. We look out. We see. But I want you to think about your experience of a day. You go through the day. And then what happens is you go through another day. And then you go through another day. And then you go through another day, and another day, and another day, and another day, and another day. And it never <coughs> stops. It just goes like that. Your experience of days is just on and on and on and on. So you have all these, all these different days. They stretch across time. They stretch across space. They cut, stretch across agency. They stretch across causation. All these different days. And there are analogies across them. You know, the sun is in the sky today. And the sun was in the sky yesterday. And the sun was in the sky the day before. And the sun set, right? There are analogies across all these days. There are also disanalogies. You never have analogy without disanalogy, right? All of these days, they're all very different. It's very important not to be confused, not to think that today is yesterday or today is tomorrow. Because if I thought today was tomorrow, then I'd have to be giving both talks at the same time. Not good. Well. Here's the pattern, just one generic blending pattern that we use. We take the analogies and we compress them to one thing. Now, instead of lots of things, we have one thing. And that's the day. And you project the disanalogies to change for that thing. Now you have The repeating day. Now here's, this is very important. No day repeats. If you woke up in the morning and the day was exactly the, as it was the day before, you would think you went crazy. There's a movie called Groundhog Day. Where, where, but even then, not every day is the same. It just starts the same way, right? Days don't repeat, but the cyclic day repeats. And now you've got something that can fit the human mind. Instead of this great expanse of time, you have the cyclic day. And you can use the cyclic day and unpack it to understand time in the Roman Empire, time three years from now, your last birthday, tomorrow. Because you can, all, you can unpack all of it from the cyclic day. You have change for an entity. This is one of the most common blending patterns we have. So for instance, we talk about dinosaurs turning into birds evolutionarily. No dinosaur turned into a bird. No dinosaur changed. What you have is lots of, lots of dinosaurs. And there are analogies across them, and there are disanalogies across them. And you compress all those dinosaurs down to the dinosaur, and all of the disanalogies down to change. You say, the dinosaur changed into a bird, changed, turned into a bird. You watch this kind of pattern, taking lots of things that shouldn't go together and compressing them down into one thing that then changes. It's very common to us. We do it with calendars. We do it with the year. We do it with the presidential election cycle. We do it with graduation every year in a university. Every year starts with commencement. Uh, a convocation and ends with commencement, right? We have a cycle for the year. We have a cycle for Christmas. Now, here's another kind of blending compression. 
There was a man named uh, Hikam El Gurush, and a while back, he set the world record in the mile. The mile is an English measure, right? It's a very fast sprinter. And the New York Times wanted you to understand how fast he moved, right? And in order to show you that, they made this little graphic, and they took the fastest milers from the previous five decades, and they put them on this track where they would have been when Hikam El Garouche crossed the finish line if they had run at a constant speed. So here's Roger Bannister way back here who broke the four-minute mile record in 1954, right? Now what's happening here? Well, we have all these different input spaces, 1954, 1958, 1967, 79, 85, 1999. These people never ran against each other. Some of them never met each other. But now you can take all those different spaces and project them down to one track and put them all on one track. And now in the blend, I have something I can understand. I can say, for instance, things like um, Hikam El Garouche defeated Roger Bannister by 120 yards. And everybody immediately understands. This is the easy thing to understand. This is not the math problem. This is what you get instantaneously. That helps you understand the whole article. No one says to me, Professor Turner, you are insane. Roger Bannister and Hikam El Garouche did not run against each other. How can you say that Hikam El Garouche defeated Roger Bannister by 120 yards? It's because we have this new idea with emergent properties. I can notice how strange this is. Up in every one of these spaces, these people were not only winners, they set the world record up here in what you know about them historically. But now down in the blend, they're losers. They are winners up here. They come down and they're losers down here. You have a new understanding by taking all of these tracks and people running the mile and putting them together. And now you have language. So you can say things like, you know, he defeated him, he beat him, he defeated him by 120 yards. This is a pattern of fictive interaction. Things that didn't actually interact, that you didn't see, you blend together and then they interact in the blend. And we're very good at understanding interaction between organisms. So if we can take things across time, space, causation, and agency, where there isn't any interaction, and compress them down in a blend to something we understand where there is an interaction with lots of new ideas in there and new features like defeating and misery, and things like that, then you can hold on to that and carry it with you and expand it to understand things that otherwise would be too hard for us to grasp. There's a lot of work on fictive interaction uh, just reference it here, but you can go to, where can you go to find out about all this stuff? Anybody remember? <coughs> SSRN is a good place, but the way to get there is to go to markturner.org. <laughs> okay, what's my name? <laughs> there you go, markturner.org. So I'm going to show you this kind of fictive interaction and the amazing creativity that it can produce. So here's a riddle. And this riddle has been used since the 1950s. A psychologist named Carl Dunker used it. It's the riddle of the Buddhist monk, and I want you to solve this riddle. There's a Buddhist monk who begins at dawn one day, walking up a mountain. He reaches the top at sunset, meditates at the top overnight, until at dawn he begins to walk back to the foot of the mountain, which he reaches at sunset. So don't make any assumptions about how he moves. He just stays on the path. But he could stop. He could smell the flowers. You know, he could look at the sea. By the way, thank you all for being here. You could be out in the beautiful, warm seawater. I went swimming last night. The idea that you have, are here instead of being in the ocean, that's really very impressive. 
So is there a place on the path that the monk inhabits at the same time of day on the two successive days? Now, you might not know where it is, but is there one? Does there have to be one? Well, let me show you. Here's the Buddhist monk. Up he goes. He reaches the top at sunset. Bing, sits down, meditates overnight. Next on, he gets up, goes back down, reaches the bottom of the path at dawn. Now, notice, by the way, I just collapsed two days into 10 seconds. That's not... In case you didn't know, that's not really a Buddhist monk, okay? This is not really a mountain path. That's not really the moon. So there's always a ton of blending that I'm not talking about. The purpose here is not to give a, a reading of these things, but to focus on what's going on. Okay, is there a place on the path that the monk occupies at the same hour of the day on the two successive days? Well, I won't embarrass you. I've had lots of mathematicians say, well, there could be but that would be accidental. Or, well, if you make the assumption of constant speed, but no, no, no assumption of constant speed, right? And you can go to markturner.org and look at blending box experiments, and I give three mathematical proofs of what I'm about to show you. Suppose you take these two things that shouldn't go together, one day and the next day. You shouldn't confuse them. You shouldn't confuse an ascent with a descent, right? But now superimpose them overlap them. All I did here is take my flash file of the little Buddhist monk and clip off the second half and lay it over the first half. Are you ready? Here we go. It's dawn. You superimpose the two days. So at dawn, you have two monks, one at the top and one at the bottom, right? They traverse the mountain path. They have to meet somewhere. And where they meet is the point that they occupy at the same hour of the day on the two successive days. They could meet many times if they backtracked and did things like this, right? Um, I just... Uh, oh, they have to meet at the same time because the way I got you to do this is by projecting so that the times are connected across the two days, and you project down the time into the blend, and you keep the time constant. Now, what's interesting about this is it's true, even if you don't do it that way, you could have the hopping monk, you could project it down differently, but people don't. They don't do that. They keep what we call the topology constraint. They keep the time, the time-space adjacency, the time-space ordering. They keep that constant as they project down into the blend. And I want, to, I want you to notice something else. There's a new feature here, and I can refer to it, and that's the meeting. In the original story, there's no meeting. There's no interaction. In the ascent, there's no meeting. In the descent, there's no meeting. In the ascent plus the descent, there's no meeting. But when you blend them, now they meet. You have a new feature, and you have language. You can say, oh, the place is where the monk meets, and then you say, himself. Now you have a reflexive, which is not grammatical for the original story, because there aren't two monks that are, that are identical. But now in the blend, there are. So what's happened is you get these two input spaces, <laughs> lots of connections across them, you project down. Notice you bring down the two monks, but you don't collapse them, even though they're identical. You bring down the two mountain paths, but you do collapse them into one path, right? You bring down the two dawns, and now they're the dawn. You don't bring down lots of things. You don't project down lots of things. You don't project the date, the calendrical date. And you also don't project a whole lot of things for the monk. You don't say, oh, well, he would never meet himself, Professor Turner, because as he's going up the hill, he sees himself, and he freaks out, and he's terrified, and he runs in the other direction. Notice, you, you never did any of that. You didn't project that down. So you don't bring down everything, and there's new stuff. There's new stuff down there. And when you get down there, then you have meeting and, and so on. So what I would like to say is it may well be that you have more working memory evolutionarily, just as those anthropologists thought. 
And this is helping you blend. The more you can keep in mind, the more you can blend, the more grist you have for blending, because you are not controlled by your present environment. Your present environment usually doesn't have things that don't go together because they're all just right here, right? But if you can combine something in perception with something in memory, then you can really get two things that are in massive conflict. So having better memory might help more blending. And the better you are at blending, the more evolutionary advantage there is to having that kind of memory. So these two theories of working memory and long-term memory uh, go together. Now, one of the things that human beings are exceptionally good at is social cognition, understanding other minds. This is very, very creative. So the truth is, no one has any direct access to anybody else's mind. In cognitive science, in neuroscience, in psychology, we're always trying to talk about minds. But just look at me here, right? What's happening? A few photons are striking your retina. A few longitudinal waves are striking your ears. You can't see my mind. But when you look in my eyes, it seems as if you can see my ideas. My eyes don't just look open. They look alert and interested. But you can't see alertness or interest or boredom. That's an inference. How do we get that inference? Well, we have ourselves and we have other people. And you know, they look a lot like us. There are these analogies. But I know certain things about myself. That is, when I walk and move like this, it's because I perceive this and I don't want to hit it. So when you do that, I think the same of you. Or when I look at something and I react, well, I move like that, I think I'm reacting to something, right? So when I see you do it, I think it's this. In other words, I can take what I know of my mind and what I see of you and put them together, and now you have a mind. You're not just moving. You're not just acting. Now you have a very rich mind, and of course I learned that you have your mind is a lot like mine, but in some ways it's not like mine. I eat spicier food than you do, right? So you make adjustments and so on. So this power of putting things together that shouldn't really go together, like you and me, is available to invent the idea of you, a very rich idea of you. And it may seem as if other species have this idea. Dogs are very good at sort of understanding the emotions of their masters. But in fact, um, the other great apes, mammals and so on, have a very limited ability relative to our own to understand other minds. This has been known for a long time. I would refer you to Adam Smith on the theory of mind in the, the theory of the moral emphasis uh, sentiments. So let's see an example of putting together things that don't go together. One of the things we do, says Adam Smith, is we sympathize with the dead, right? We, we think how terrible it is to be deprived of the light, to be decaying, right? But as Adam Smith goes through, for the corpse, there's no suffering. There's no sorrow at being deprived of the light. There's no sorrow at, at the decay, right? We're loaning our mind, our judgment of those kinds of things to something else. He goes through this for at, at great length. Here's one in law. There's a thing called a decedent. A decedent is a legal person. It's a quasi-agent. So, you know, when people aren't here anymore, sometimes they've left documents or wills or something like that about what they want to do. And so in law, there's this term, the decedent. Now, this decedent is a person, but we're not confused. We say things like, if the decedent has no surviving spouse, and what I want to point out is, this is the present tense. How can, the, how can somebody who's not here have anything in the present tense? 
Well, because the decedent is right here, mentally. We can say, if the decedent has living parents, siblings, nieces, or nephews, or the decedent leaves his house, we don't say the decedent left. We don't put it into the past tense. That's not grammatical in English, right? So here's an idea, nobody's confused, but we have a concept of a decedent who's a quasi-agent. And we can refer to the decedent. And if you look around human cognition, there are lots and lots of these quasi-agents. You ask your dead grandmother for advice. What would my grandmother say about this? Your grandmother, you know, you meet somebody, you want to get married, what would your grandmother say? Well, your grandmother never met this person, but you put together an idea of what your grandmother might say. These quasi-agents are all over, and they've been studied. But it's not just the idea of other people, it's the idea of ourself. We think we have an identity and that we change. I'm very different from the baby that popped out of my mother 60 years ago, right? And yet, culture wants me to think that there's a Mark Turner. What kind of strange idea is that? Where did this idea of personal identity that lasts over decades come from? Well, you know where it came from. There are analogies and disanalogies across everything in my lifetime, and you compress the analogies to one thing, Mark Turner. It seems as if there's a person here. And the disanalogies to change for Mark Turner. Ah, Mark Turner got a degree. Mark Turner traveled to Europe. Mark Turner learned about this and that and the other. Mark Turner had the great benefit of learning from you people last night at Curva do Vento, right? Um, now, you can also decompress these ideas. This will be my last example before I open up the floor because there's a ton of things to say and I'd love to hear your questions. So once you get this compressed idea of the cyclic day or anything else we've been talking about, you can decompress it. So people talk to themselves. They see themselves in the mirror and the face in the mirror may be because of the hairdo or the clothes, looks a little bit like they did when they were young. And then they have a conversation with their young self, right? The old person says to the young person, I really let you down, didn't I? Now, the voice comes from this person, but in the blend, it's attaching to the young person in the mirror. So you have this compressed self, but you can separate it out to two selves, my young self and my present self, and now you can recompress it recompress it, fictive interaction, by taking your idea of a conversation. And now you compress it with a conversation, and you can have a conversation with yourself. Now you can be in the present across very different times. It's a time compression, like the Buddhist monk. Or the person in the mirror can say, you did OK, right? This doesn't look strange to us. Why do we not think people are insane? Because they can decompress these things and then recompress them. So I would show you a, a clip from Pulp Fiction in which Vincent Vega, he has to take his boss's girlfriend out to dinner and they go dancing, right? It's a wonderful scene. It's uh, John Travolta and uh, Liz... What's her name? Liv Alwyn, right. And uh, so they go back home, and he drops her off, and she says, come in for a drink. Now, it's a very bad idea for him to do anything more than have a drink, right? It's a, because his boss is a fearsome person, right? And he is an honorable man, is Vincent Vega. So he looks in the mirror, and he says to himself, one drink and leave. Don't be rude, but drink your drink quickly, say goodbye, walk out the door, get in your car and go down the road. It's a moral test of yourself. Whether or not you can maintain loyalty, because when people are loyal to each other, that's very meaningful. So you're gonna go out there, drink your drink, say goodnight, I've had a very lovely evening, go home, and that's all you're gonna do. Now, something that comes in here, another blend, is you know that when you have to talk to somebody that, strongly, 
and with that much repetition that it's not working. That you don't think it's going to work. So he's actually, I've got another part of the blend here. He's talking to himself, but he's got huge anxiety. Okay? Now, there are two points that I'll end on. One is human beings, all human beings, are born geniuses. They, for the last 50,000 years, at least everybody everywhere has had this ability to put together things that don't go together to make compressed human scale little blends with emergent properties, right? And sometimes artists or inventors show us this. They, they put together, uh, you know, a calculator and a phone and it becomes an iPhone and suddenly we say, wow, who knew that everybody on earth needed an iPhone? We, you can see it. Sometimes somebody carves a lion man. Sometimes you see somebody talking to himself in the mirror in Pulp Fiction. So artists and inventors sometimes do things that let us see some of this magic of blending. But the second point is 99.999% of blending conceptual integration is just invisible to us. It's happening in the backstage of cognition all the time. It's too powerful for consciousness to run, right? So our job here in looking at creativity is to try to analyze something that we take for granted. We, we, don't, we don't realize how creative we are. But if we want to look at the roots of creativity, we have to understand that this is something that's happening in everybody all the time. And the example I would leave you with is that little tool set, which if I gave to that child last night who was listening to Jim Morrison and the Doors uh, sing Before I Slip Into Unconsciousness, and who was blending in all the characters he'd ever seen, and people were engaged in play simulation with the child, right? That kid is creative every second. Compare that with 800,000 years of a tool set in our recent ancestors never changing. Thank you very much.